anyone could be said to have proverbially thrown the cat amongst the pigeons in the vague and incestuous history of Tajichuan, then I would argue that it was Chen Manqing. Although there is a tendency to dismiss him and his bastardised version of the Yang form as a minor deviant from the straight and narrow path constructed by the Grand Masters of other major styles, I believe this is not only a myopic interpretation of his influence, but one that strangles any possibility for evolution of the art, and this is why. Wow. Some might argue, professional therapists for example, that there's been something of an obsession in the art with tradition and authority, partly because it's been perpetuated and presented this way in order to sell the mysticism of the East. And let's face it, it's an easy market employ. But also because as protagonists ourselves, teachers and students, our silence contributes to the maintenance of rigidity and the inflexibility of these traditions. Others argue that these traditions contain the essence of the art and therefore must never be tampered with. But mostly this argument comes from those that benefit from their untouchable status. What is touchable and what is not? Who gets to say? Who decides and who decides on who decides? If we don't ask these questions, then habits, practices, attitudes, even the language and jargon that is tossed so easily from one generation to another are sanctified by the approving nod of selected grandmasters. Uh -oh. Change and re-evaluation are rarely embraced, leading to a situation in which, if you've read the Tao Te Ching, the moment is ripe for an ideological implosion, and it doesn't take much. So when someone like Chen Manqing appears on the scene, initially playing the game Hello, and acting as expected, but then shifts the emphasis away from the past, frowns appear everywhere, and schools close rank against such changes. This tendency is of course endemic in all martial arts and Tai Chi is no different in this respect. Look at the creation of every new style that is born from the ashes of older generations. Look at when Chen Manqing initially created his short form without the approval of the Yang family or later when he arrived in New York and like Bruce Lee taught Westerners to the horror and despair of the traditionalists. But I would argue that this natural evolution of any art is always greeted in this way, for it's simply the establishment resisting change. Such resistance, though understandable in many practices, seems contradictory in an art like Tai Chi that claims to have its philosophical roots embedded in Taoism. <laughs> So it is to the writings of the Tao that perhaps we should turn, away from the literal translations or interpretations of scriptures, away from the restraints of chronology and timelines, away from the straight and narrow paths laid out by those appointed to serve as barometers of their art, but look instead to the spirit that is found in action, relationships and Laughter. I 
I know, I know it's a complex picture, and this presentation runs the risk of descending into petty differences of interpretation. So before that happens, let's take a look at a couple of examples, likeness of being and the wielding of power. If you watch any old video of Chen Man Ching teaching in New York, you will see a man that did not stand on formality or protocol. His classes appear full of laughter and jokes, relaxed and playful students exploring with him in an open and inquisitive atmosphere. Now contrast this to many schools that insist on set curriculums, on uniforms and Upon entering, bow into Sifu, bow into the incense stick, bow into the portraits of grand masters while observing a monastic silence. Little room here for experiment, no time for play. Though Chen Manqing came from a classical and traditionalist background, circumstances of movement, of emigration and travel forced him to reassess and rewrite his ideas. He came to epitomise and embrace change through his relationships with others. This lightness of being, this gentle touch of which so many speak, was reinforced crucially by his displacement of power. He never referred to himself as a master with all the dubious connotations this has in the martial arts community. Another easy market employ Exhibit your grades, your uniform, your belts, your adopted title and let the marketing work for you. Chen Manqing preferred his university title as professor. And if you're asking yourself what's the difference, then take out a few minutes and think about it. Even when Chen Manqing created his famous short form, long before such forms existed in other styles, his aim was to release Tai Chi from the incestuous grip that the elite and aristocratic classes in Chinese society held over the practice. He tried to prize it away from those that jealously guarded its rituals and its teachings and leave it in the open arms of the general public. Now, power relations define much of what we do today, what's decided in our name, who gets to make those decisions, and in whose name they're taken. Many argue that real power lies outside our grasp, financially, politically, socially, so it's important we learn to see where it is wielded and by whom, and challenge that structure if it doesn't give us a voice. Chen Manqing structured his classes openly, wherein all students at all levels practiced together, and he never sought or offered gradings or systems or, or the self-congratulating certificates that cover many a training hall wall today. When he spoke to his students of the future, at the time when perhaps he would not be there to teach them himself, he didn't recommend they merely shuttled along to the next nearest school down the road, but instead encouraged them to continue learning amongst each other, helping each other to grow and expand and then to go out and teach the art to everyone. For we learn not only from teachers, but by doing it for ourselves. And that the answers we often seek are best found within ourselves, rather than from some master or descendant of the family line. You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. For all these reasons, I believe that the Chen Manqing style and form is worthy of our time and study. It's not to be dismissed as a minor variant of the Yang form, but instead it represents another direction in which Tai Chi can go. His form is not just straightforward and easy to learn, but his approach to Tai Chi, one of simplicity, 
his approach to power structures and to teaching and learning serves as an important example, particularly at the time when masters and systems appear regularly in our social media feeds, expounding yet more nonsense and trivia. We have at least the tools to evaluate when we study alongside the Tao Te Ching and have teachers like Chen Man Jing, and maybe we too can find the treasures beneath these simple moves. So where are the riches of which he spoke? Chen Man Jing's simple approach to living and learning, learning from oneself as well as each other, his polite and diplomatic deconstruction of lineage and formal tradition, and his lightness and emphasis on relaxation in order to learn encourages us all to loosen our sweaty grip on the world of paper certificates and shiny things, and opens us to another activity, one composed of 37 simple steps offer tranquility, poise, elegance, flow, balance in all things and in all our relationships. Now that is indeed a mountain of riches. <laughs>